Hi, everybody. This is Marcus Fairs broadcasting live from the Dezine Studio in London. And here today, we're here to discuss health and well-being with Cola. We have three great speakers from all across the world. We have Tony Chi, who's an interior designer, founder of Tony Chi Studio from, from New York, but he's actually in Taiwan right now. Hi, Tony. Hi there, Tony. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Sorry, I just have to get this on mute. Sorry, my apology. Yes, I can hear you well. Thank you, Marcus. Hello, everyone. Good to meet you. And we have Ryan Hullinger, who's a partner at NBJJ Architects, calling in from Columbus, Ohio. Hi there, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Great to see you all. And finally, we have Loon Chik Tan, who's VP of Industrial Design at Kola, calling from the village of Kola in Wisconsin. Hi there, Loon. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Right, before we get into the presentations, let's have a little quick introduction from everybody. Tony, just give us a quick introduction to yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Tony. Well, you know, I, I find a true passion about uh, the culture of hospitality. And of course, the hospitality is everywhere in, in, our, in our lives. Uh, and I find no boundary to it. I find, uh, as we in the design field call it, blur, blur the line. Uh, not clearly define what it is. Uh, so I've been practicing uh, uh, the, uh, the design, the invisible design for the last 40 years. Uh, from what I've been doing to what I am doing now is absolutely creating a design without, without the noun. You can't really say, well, is that a living room or is that a bedroom or is that a, is that a study, but rather it's a human space. Uh, and that is what we call it, the space presenting its hospitality to you. I mean, if I share some of the images uh, with you, uh, as I call it, the invisible design and what exactly is the invisible design? I mean, can we see the, some of the images? So the invisible design- not, Tony, not just yet, not just yet. We'll just, yep. the quick introduction, we'll go to the presentations in just a minute. But quickly, since we're talking okay. about health and well-being. How important is interior design to make people feel better about themselves? That must be something that um, you've got strong, strong views on. Well, well, absolutely. Oftentimes people look at interior design from the tangible aspect. Well, you can also look at it from intangible side of it, right? Whether you want to see it or you want to feel it. And I think both are equally important. Now we have all heard the form follows the function for years. So not what exactly is a function. Do we actually define that scientifically, right? So, so the reality of it is uh, how do we then elevate uh, everything around us, including the users, right? Rather than say, well, I'm an interior designer here. I'm taking the world as my stage. Let me show you what I do. But I think for me, rather than say, there is the well, I'm not on the stage and there, there's no stage uh, for any of us, but rather to do what we do to elevate everything else around it. And that's the reason I call it the culture of hospitality. Great. Well, we'll come back to you in just a minute for your presentation, mm -hmm. but Ryan, tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. So, hey everyone, I'm Ryan Hollinger. I'm an architect, a designer, and a partner at NBBJ. And I co-lead NBBJ's global healthcare practice. I don't know if you know our firm well, but about half of the work we do is in healthcare and hospitals. And then half of it is outside of traditional forms of healthcare, corporate, commercial, civic. And actually, I think it's great because we're bringing the best ideas from both of those practice areas or all of those practice areas to bear on one another. My focus being very specific within healthcare and working with hospital clients is thinking about a future of hyper adaptability, uh, hospitals that don't need to be replaced as technology evolves, but actually adapt and are more resilient. And I'm also thinking about the way that beauty and performance come together within the design of a hospital and ensuring that both of those things are happening at the same time. So it's, it's optimized for the clinicians and their work, but then also the well-being of the clinicians and, of course, the patients and the families. Great. Thanks very much. And Loon, finally, Loon Chik Tan from Kola. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Loon, and the work that you do. Right, so um, um, I've um, been in the industrial design uh, field for almost 30 years now. Um, I grew up in Singapore, um, spent my last 
prior to this year, I spent my last seven years uh, running the Asia Pacific Design Studios uh, for Kola based in Shanghai. I moved here about a year ago, exactly a year ago actually to Kola, Wisconsin. And now, now I'm running the industrial design organization for Kola Kitchen and Bath. And we're here to talk about health and well-being. And this is because Cola has launched um, an initiative, Dimensions of Wellbeing, that you're calling it this year. Where each year you do a study, don't you, into a, a trend or something that's important in the, in the space that, you, that Cola works in. Tell us about this year's project, Dimensions of Wellbeing. What is that looking into? Well, um, I mean, the, the whole notion of health and well-being has been... Um, uh, central to our business since day one, right? So, um, and we slice and dice health and well-being in many different ways, right? There's well-being, which, you know, uh, and, and health, you know, big part and, and part of which is um, uh, the whole notion of uh, cleanliness in the bathroom and kitchen space. Um, and, and now, especially with, you know, the whole COVID situation, you know, the, the, the whole topic around clean and hygiene, health and well-being becomes more acute because, uh, we realize that our users and, and you know, the whole community, our, our, our customer community has become more keenly aware of this topic. So I think it's a great opportunity for us to bring this up, have conversations around it. And um, it's something that we, you know, it's, it's a constant work in progress for us, right? As we, we put solutions out there into the market. So, you know, it's a great opportunity for us to kind of connect with the community, the, the community of interior designers, architectures, you know, designers, as a whole, for us to learn more and, and kind of share perspective of what that is, right? So, you know, this this conversation, this learning is, is a wonderful opportunity for us. And just for anyone who doesn't know, tell us what Cola is. What does Cola do? What does it stand for? Tell us a little bit about the company. Wow, that's a loaded question. But, uh, you know, fundamentally, I would <laughs> say Cola is a brand, really, it's about gracious living, um, you know, if I have to put it really simply. Um, and, you know, we, we deliver solutions in the kitchen and bath space. So, you know, in the bathroom space, you know, you have faucets, you have toilets, um, laths, furnitures, um, shower, shower doors, you know, everything that you see in the bathroom, um, cola does, right? And in the kitchen space, we have kitchen cabinets in, in China, um, we have sinks, we have faucets as well. So it's really about connecting all of these pieces to deliver the best experience within those spaces. That's fundamentally what we do. And we have to deliver a more gracious experience for our customers. Great. Thanks very much. Well, we'll hear more about um, perspectives of the year and dimensions of well-being in a few minutes. But let's go back to Tony now. Tony, do you want to share your screen with us and tell us a little bit more about your work? Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. And thank you uh, for this opportunity uh, to share our point of view. And I have been talking about invisible design for nearly 40 years. And, and often people say, well, if I pay you, why should I make my design invisible? I, I think the invisible design, uh, as I often talked about invisible design is in everyday living. Now, in other words, I, I feel and I truly believe uh, the subconsciousness that we all should have uh, in everything we're doing, everywhere we touch and everything we encounter. Uh, and of course, uh, in the subject of the wellness. Uh, you know, wellness has been around all of us for a lot of centuries. And, and some of us take it in one way scientifically and some people take it artistically. We, we're trying to look at it from wellness is an essential. In other words, if we are well enough mentally, uh, we certainly can be well enough physically. And how do we combine them? So often people look at interior designers creating space and they can comment on, oh, I like the colors or oh, I like the furniture. We say none of that is important. And we believe everything we have within the space make the greatest symphony uh, in our lives, right? And that life can be all yours under your domain. So, so invisible design is something Tony Chi has been talking about it for 40, 40 years. And rather than focusing on something uh, uh, trendy or something uh, scientific or anything specific. On the next next uh, image that you'll see, that we, we, we never really look at anything the way it should be. 
people say a vanity need to look like a vanity. A mirror need to look at like a mirror. A bowl of water where you can put your feet in it should be a football, but that should look like a certain way. We say, well, it doesn't have to be. And we can interpret that any way we should, any way we want. Okay, and next please. And then of course, uh, and looking at uh, the blur, how do we blur the room? And who says the bathroom needs to be a bathroom? Why could that not be part of the living space? You gonna get dressed and you gonna get undressed. Why can we not combine them together? And why can we not linger uh, in a space uh, to create certain wellness uh, emotionally? Next. Uh, then you look at a space where you rest. That doesn't mean you shut the light and go to bed. And I mean, you, you may physically shut off your body. It doesn't mean you are emotionally detached. So we're creating a space where you're physically able to transform a space as part of you. And we believe that space should be defined as a wellness, equally as you looking at yourself in the mirror. Do you see your body or do you see your soul? How much time do you spend in that space? And that is bring uh, subconsciousness uh, with certain awakening process. Next. Okay. And again, I mentioned about blurring the space. I don't have a boundary. I don't believe in wall. And I don't believe in a space should defined by four walls to say, here's a bathroom. You go there to do certain tasks. And when you're done with it, you go to another space. We do believe in the line gets really blurred and how you transform subconsciously. Next. Okay. And once again, uh, on any uh, expected uh, Vanity, how often, uh, how much time do we spend in front of vanity? How, how many of us actually pay attention to where, where, where are we using this tool every day as a part of our life, the morning, the night, and so on and so forth. So we are trying to make that connection and that awareness uh, it is to marry the tangible with the intangible. Next. Okay, uh, and then once again, who says you can have a salon space, living room next to a bathroom? Why can we not combine that together? Next. Okay, uh, I'll call us share this thing with you. Uh, this is the Carlisle in New York. You know, again, something I won't dare to touch it. Carlisle being hundred years old, it's an institution. Only in the wall can talk. So all I am trying to do is contain it. So the whisper does not travel beyond the wall. Uh, and yet creating the space capture every bit of the spirit. You know, 100 years ago, what people do in this space and how do I capture that and represent it to the modern world? Next. Okay, uh, then once again, once again, that you're looking at the living room and the swimming pool. Oftentimes, formality becomes something in our life that we define clearly. And I think uh, to blur the line to say, why could we not live a space? Why can we not live a moment? How do we integrate that? How do we bring something as we call it emotionally uh, uh, important into our physical importance part of the life? Uh, then you look at where do you wanna celebrate? Where do you want people to spend the time? Of course, collaborate, color uh, in many projects by saying, hey, can we develop something to arouse people's emotion? Next. Okay. Uh, and once again, uh, this is the project in, uh, in Tokyo, on the Tokyo. Uh, creating a space, how many people can look at it? Well, can I, I can have a maple wood bathroom, uh, wood using in the bathroom. It, it's unheard of it, but no one said the bathroom needs to be institutional looking. So we basically create a space that gives you certain warmth uh, and certain element with a craft that integrated into everyday life. Next. Okay, now oftentimes people asking for answer for everything and I don't have everything. So I always say the answer is blowing in the wind and Bob Dylan make that very clear to all of us for the last 30, 40 years. So anyway, thank you very much for sharing time with me. Thanks, Tony. So what is your relationship with Cola then? Have you worked with them on many, many products, uh, projects? Uh, we have, you know, every, you know, one thing great about our industry is about partnership. Uh, we must know what we don't know. So you go to the people who knows, then you raise the question about what you don't know and they will then educate you. And through this process, you find greatness 
uh, uh, come out of it at the end. And Kohler has been our partner for, well, since I've been in the industry, uh, sometimes being a young designer, you, you pick the wrong thing and they can guide you. Uh, not being mature enough, I can set up a new challenge with them to say, well, I desire, uh, not the aesthetic, but certain function to have uh, the devices to do certain job. How do we do that? And, and they had the R&D, you know, Loom uh, and all the entire design team will somehow meet that goal. And this is basically the collaboration in our industry that we have. So, so I think they make me a better designer, supposed, uh, <laughs> through, through over the years. Yeah, and working with you makes us a better, better team as well. So like yeah, Thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tony, have you found that clients' um, requirements have changed due to the pandemic? Is there more of a focus on well-being now because people want to feel cozier at home or want to feel more cleaner at home or more sanitized? Has that impacted what people are looking for? Well, Marcus, this is absolutely a great question. I think, you know, the last oh, less than one year, eight, eight nine months, and we've gone into a fear factor or a way of looking at life. And people's got a lot of questions. Uh, and, and, and I don't think anybody know how to prioritize it. Uh, uh, Loom says uh, hygiene. No, hygiene, no doubt. Uh, it's on the top of the chart, right? So you, you see people want to clean everything. So, so sometimes you over hygiene and the thing can look very institutional. So, so in reality, uh, with this pandemic, what did it teach us? It teach us to be intimate. And that being intimate means you are more manageable of yourself. Then you can then manage yourself, others. And that's called collective one, right? Now, you know, one plus one becomes two. Now we can talk about two plus two becomes four. So how do we manage this expansion? And I think that awareness, I actually find it quite interesting. You know, I, I have been talking to people about not creating a singular living room where everyone's sitting into one group. Is it possible to create two, three, four different groups, right? So, so people can have different conversation within the room. So that's called small group, intimate social circle, right? And that we talked about it for years, right? Equally, we may say, sure, you can look at a large hotel, 400 rooms, 500 rooms, but you can create a small lobby to be perceived very intimate, but yet create those non-hotel guests enter through the public entrance, right? You separate them. I mean, that would help the COVID-19 as well, right? So that means you, you in fact, protect your in-house guest to say, you're staying with us, you have a private access, and we'll watch after you, right? And that's called eliminating the fear within them. So I think the fear or the fear factor has been probably the largest thing. And people do ask a lot of questions about that. And finally, before we move on to Ryan, you mentioned a couple of times this idea of like institutional bathrooms. Uh, it's, it's, and then you talked about people don't design wooden bathrooms that much and, and why not? But I, I suppose if you look back, the kind of institutional look came from previous pandemics, right? The early modernists, the early 20th century architects and designers wanted to create spaces that felt clean. So they had white tiles and everything could be scrubbed down. Do you think we've, we've moved away from that now? Are we able to move away from that because of technology and, and advances in cleanliness and so on and so forth? Well, well I, I, I think, well, again, Marcus, I, I think that's terrific that you reach back to then and now. I, I don't think from architecture, interior design perspective that we give up the purity of design. I think that's very much intact. However, the function and the duration of the thing we design have certainly changed its course. You know, oftentimes we use a bathroom 50 years ago for a singular purpose and you have no lingering opportunity in those spaces. Today, people linger a bit longer. So, uh, so I, I think the duration certainly change. Uh, I, I, when I say institution, what I meant by that is there is a very clear boundary defined, uh, uh, for example, the healthcare facility versus residential facility, right? And I, I think you can see visually, physically, emotional difference between a hospital space versus a hotel space, for example, 
I mean, there, there's no blurness on that at all. So, so, so I, I think this is basically where I, I, I call how do we then uh, merge that? Uh, and how do we not having science driving the artistic way of life? Or perhaps the other way around as well. Yeah, can I, can I add to that as well? I think, you know, Tony mentioned about, you know, the whole blurring of space space, there was a, a, a period in time where, you know, the bathroom is actually called the water closet, right? And where you have four mm. sets that, you know, hides inside a closet. And, and there was a time where, you know, plumbing wasn't that advanced, you know, you, you have exposed pipes and, and people have a particular notion of what clean and hygiene is. And then, and then, you know, eventually, you know, technology allows it to move out of the closet space and it became a bathroom, you know, and now Tony is talking about this whole, you know, getting things out of the bathroom and blurring between the bathroom and the bedroom, for example, right? So, you know, I think, you know, it's an event, it's, it's eventually where things is going to go. I think, you know, the, the whole COVID situation probably kind of accelerated the, uh, the, the trend a little bit. That's, that would be my take. So the bathroom's almost taking over the whole hotel suite or the whole well i wouldn't say that I, say, I mean tony I, I don't know what what you think but you know um 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 i, I wouldn't say the bathroom is going to take over everything mm -hmm. but it's just this whole blurring of space where you know you you, you it, it's not as predefined as it used to be i would say well, well super just interesting. to find that you know you know marcus you know you know you mentioned this about taking over i think it's still scientifically bathroom in the hotel space Still probably around forty percent. Okay, I think basically, basically what we do is how do we enhance it? How do we let people use it longer and more, and add value to it? Uh, I, I think that's basically uh, what we collectively are all doing: architect, designer, and industrial designer. Great, thanks so much, Ryan. Let's go over to you now. Do you want to fire up your presentation and share that with us? Yeah, so you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Great, okay. Well, Tony's talk was a great intro because even talking, as Tony said, about science and art ties into what I was saying about performance and beauty. There's a lot of overlap there. And the idea of blurring is something we're extremely focused on. I mentioned that in my intro, how we're thinking about multiple practice areas like workplace and how actually there is a connection between workplace and a hospital design. And even thinking through you know, a future of healthcare that is not contained within the boundaries of a hospital, but certainly spreads into other environments that are more convenient for people. And we've all seen that during COVID via telehealth, where healthcare is happening in the space of the home. And it's that kind of blurring, to use Tony's word, that we're really interested in, which is why we actually began with a non-hospital image. This image is from the Amazon Spheres, uh, a project that we've done in Seattle, the headquarters for Amazon. You see that on the outside. This is a workplace innovation. This is thinking about a whole new way of combining nature and science to do workplace in a different way. And it transcends the conversation about private office versus open office for sure. And it thinks about new ways of connectivity and what it means to be in a fundamentally different kind of workplace and what that does to pro productivity and or workplace optimization. Now I show this to my healthcare clients and they think, well, that's Amazon. That's, that's, not, that's perhaps not my budget, but actually what we're doing is thinking about this and, and how it does work within a traditional healthcare environment. So even scaling that down, a prefabricated micro-scaled version of the Amazon spheres, and this is a COVID specific response. It says, well, right now during COVID, you actually have a lot of waiting areas that are underutilized because people are waiting in their cars. So how could we take over some of that underutilized space and bring value back to it? So this can work for a workplace. It can be staff rejuvenation. And we're, we're digging into this, but it's important to know too that we've been pushing this for 10 years. This is a project that we completed 10 years ago for Mass General in Boston. Actually an interesting precursor to this sphere is where you have this open space the patient rooms are arrayed around it. Again, technology and nature all coming together. And then this is the patient room view out into that space. So again, super high tech, but then also super high touch. And that patient and that staff both benefit from that connection to nature. We also think about clinical performance. 
not just in the final outcome of the building, but even in terms of the way it's constructed and how that construction could lead to a future of hyper adaptability. Again, where we're not thinking of a hospital as something that becomes prematurely obsolete and therefore ends up demolished and thrown in a landfill, but how you can make something that adapts over time. And so in this case, we're thinking about patient rooms that are all standardized and identical and how to prefabricate those. And the breakthrough 10 years ago on this project was realizing that we didn't have to prefabricate an entire room. We could prefabricate the components that separate one room from another. We could do that hundreds of times in a hospital and you could essentially prefabricate an entire inpatient bed tower. We, draw, we drew those out on top of a flatbed truck, as you can see here, four of those blades arrayed. In the end, when we built this 10 years ago, we ended up doing it as two different components. One piece is one patient's toilet room and then the other patient's head wall and foot wall. And we've continued to develop this over the last 10 years and especially the componentry of that head wall that's serving the patient and the bed. And if we peel back the material in this wall, you see what we've begun to develop is this NBBJ smart chassis. And we call this the motherboard approach. And this really gets into that hyper adaptability idea because there are going to be new technologies that are embedded in this patient room that can be hosted by this wall. And we're designing the wall to host those in an intelligent way now. So it's a modular plug and play junction bay for connecting new technology. And it minimizes the disruption when you upgrade in the future. So over time, you can add power and data boxes to this or additional med gas connections. So this room can go from low acuity, like a med surge room to ultra high acuity, like cardiac or neuro ICU. You can even think about technologies that don't necessarily exist now and how they'll be located within this motherboard for instance, an AI server that's located here, or all new human interface control systems that are located here, or even robotics being hosted by this wall, imaging and procedures, and a kind of gantry that can be loaded into the wall in the future. But the, the, the bones of this are all in place for that future. And then essentially what you get is a server that's built into that wall that creates a near field patient support network. So all the other devices in the room, the smart bed, the vent, dialysis box, computer on wheels, IV pump, those are all in communication with each other and that's all hosted by this wall. The beauty of this design too is that unlike a mirrored room, which is more like what you see in a hotel, these are same handed rooms. So one patient's head wall is the other patient's foot wall. That means that that same component that we're prefabricating that's hosting life support on one side is hosting patient and family emotional support on the other side. So you get this network interface here where you can dial up your connection to health and learning, order meals, watch and relax. This is a really nice blurring between the inpatient environment and a hospitality environment as Tony was addressing. Where you can begin to think of this wall then as hosting in two different vectors physical support, life support that's coming in this direction and emotional support that's coming in the other. Or in the round, you have a connection to nature through the windows, physical support off of one axis, connection to your care team off of another, and then emotional support off of another, all hosted on this uh, motherboard chassis that's prefabricated. And the last thing I wanna talk about is how we're thinking you know, not just in terms of workplace and that applying to a hospital environment, but how COVID has pushed us to think about breaking out of the boundaries of a traditional healthcare space and actually providing primary care in a totally unorthodox uh, space like the space of a car cabin. And that was really driven by two things, demand for convenience and demand for safety. Both of these have been around for a long time. Convenience has been growing rapidly, but over the last maybe 15 years, and then safety has acutely curved up in the last nine months. But we combine both of those and we say there's a sweet spot here where in-car care needs to be explored. And essentially healthcare has been happening in the space of a car for quite a while now in pharmacy drive-throughs and then in COVID testing and then encapsulated waiting, which is our term for what a lot of you are doing now where you don't wait in waiting rooms anymore, but you pull up, wait in your car until you get a text and then you go inside. And what we're saying is what's next? How can healthcare move into the space of a car in revolutionary new ways? And that's what we're really exploring as a firm. 
And we've dug into that in two typologies. The first was we were thinking, okay, we could take the traditional drive-through approach, but then the real breakthrough was saying, ah, what if we explored a service bay approach for this? And the beauty of the service bay is that it's non-linear. So instead of the drive-through where you have serial processing, with the service bay, you get parallel processing and you get better human interface because you're not reaching through an architectural window and an automotive window to interact with the patient, but you're standing right next to the patient through a roll down window or an open door. So as we began to lay this out, working with our in-house nurses and clinicians, talking about the geometry, the space we would need, the kind of equipment that you would want to be able to pull up to the sides of the car, this is the shape that became um, dominant in our design thinking. And actually this combines the best of the drive-through and the service bay in that you never have to back up. We're really streamlining the wayfinding and maneuvering for the patient, knowing that they're probably stressed. They pull into the bay, the care providers walk up to them, equipment is brought up to the car, the appointment is completed and they can just pull out. You can see here too, that we've pulled a screen up in front. So this can even become a hybrid be between a kind of telehealth experience for potentially people who don't have access to telehealth where they live. Uh, so this is combining the best of both worlds. We laid this all out on a 60 foot module and we did that because we were thinking of existing parking lots or even parking garages on healthcare campuses. Again, as our society shifts more toward telehealth, we're thinking about parking demand lowering at healthcare campuses and how we can add value to underutilized parking spaces. And this ties into that equation quite well. So 60 foot bay in between the light poles or the structure of surface parking or structured parking, as you see laid out in this garage. A garage is great because it provides this tempered environment. The structure was all designed for automotive loading and it was also pre-designed for automotive maneuverability. And even more exciting than this, we're beginning to think about this idea potentially in malls in cities that are underutilized. Again, where you have arterial freeway access, everything was designed for the car and you have undervalued space. Again, prefabrication is always our starting point in terms of constructability. We can do the same thing here where we're loading the blades onto a flatbed truck. And when we're working on a surface lot and you do need to temper this to make it a good workplace for the caregivers, we have a prefabricated panelized system that goes over the top of that. And of course you could add solar to that if you wanted to simultaneously charge electric cars and charge the equipment inside. This is how that begins to look and feel. And that, that space and the look and feel of that space is also extremely important to us. Uh, we wanna make sure that people who are pulling into this space don't have any confusion uh, with pulling into anything that feels automotive or unclean. Again, tying into that, um, that fear factor that Tony was talking about, we wanna make sure that this feels pristine, clean and projects a sense of safety and state-of-the-art care. And that's what we're beginning to develop with the aesthetics that are tied into this design. So that was a rapid fire look at some of the things we're exploring, but uh, that's, all, that's all work that's either 10 years back or 10 years in the future and everything in between. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. So to go back to the first parts of your talk and uh, when you were talking about hospitals, um, is there, how much difference is there between designing a hospital room and designing a hotel room like Tony was showing us? I mean, I noticed that the bathroom in the hotel room took up, looked like less than 40% of the ward there, but why do hospitals look so different from hotel rooms? If, if a hotel is designed to make you feel great about yourself, why shouldn't hotels follow that, sorry, hospitals follow that same aesthetic? I think, it's a, I think that's a great question. And that's one that we've been digging into quite a bit. Uh, we don't think that they need to feel different. And we think that all of the emotional well being that's provided by a hospitality space is just as beneficial and maybe even more important in an inpatient environment like we were showing there. So we definitely don't think that they should be exclusive. And that blurring, again, is something to, that we've been digging into for a while and want to continue to explore. The people who are in those patient rooms are in a very vulnerable state, whether it's the patient or the family. And everything we can do in terms of the materiality, the aesthetics, even the views outside, the connection to nature, all of that's incredibly important to their well-being. I suppose the difference with a hotel and a hospital is that 
a hospital, you want people to to want to go home afterwards <laughs> rather than stick around as long as possible in the hospital. I can be, but it, we, it, really, we are committed to making them feel as comfortable as possible and, and especially the family. There's another set of rooms, which I, I, I cut out for the sake of time, but it really begins to get into the interior design that we're exploring. In the COVID era, people aren't, a family member isn't as comfortable with going down to the cafeteria to get something to eat. So how do you think about how, how that family member is having meals in the room? That's a new way of thinking about a healthcare environment. We were thinking about the table over the bed for the patient, but how does the, how does the spouse eat? How does a family eat in the room if the cafeteria isn't an option? So it opens up a whole new dimension to thinking about how the room supports different kinds of care, not just for the family, but also for the patient. And then the second part of your talk, this kind of intriguing idea that a hospital could be a bit like a Formula One pit stop. You drive in, right. <laughs> someone right. someone does all the procedures and then you, you drive off again. I mean, I think maybe that's more applicable in, in the United States than in Europe, where we're trying to get people out of their cars. But are you suggesting that people feel a greater sense of well-being in their automobiles than outside of them? Is that where that's coming from partly? Well, great question. I think part of that is because the car is a user controlled environment. That's why during COVID drive-throughs, at least in the US in restaurant space have been so effective. Instead of going into the restaurant and, and potentially the restaurant's even closed, but if it's open, there are some health concerns about going into that space. But you know in your car that that's an environment that you've defined. And so there's a sense of safety there that has actually made retail drive-throughs incredibly robust or resilient during the COVID era. And we're tapping into that and thinking about how to make that work better for healthcare. Also, that, so that's about safety or perceived safety. And then of course the convenience too, because instead of all the steps of parking, getting into a wheelchair or a walker, moving into a, a clinic space, going from the front door of the clinic into an exam room and then doing that process in reverse. Here, you have the convenience of never even leaving your car. So like I said before, that combination of convenience and safety, they both intersect in this design. I suppose the next logical um, step in this is that you just live in your car the whole time. <laughs> that could be. I hope not. <laughs> I, I, uh, and again, Part of what we explored too with this was thinking about the way that the car fundamentally changed the way food is served. And again, this might be a more American thing with the drive-through, but drive-through car dining doesn't mean that there isn't real value in sitting around a table and having a meal together. That's still an incredibly important ritual. But in the United States in the 1950s, there was a whole nother set of meaning that was, that was layered on top of the opportunity to have a meal in a car. And both of those things were infused with meaning. Both of them were really important to our society and both of them became important platforms for dining. It's not to say that one is better than the other, but both are meaningful. And certainly um, both are financially profitable. And, and so we're digging into that in terms of healthcare as well. Tony, have you ever thought about designing a bathroom for a car? What would a, what would a walk-in shower look like in an automobile? Well, listen, you know, I don't have a car. I don't go through car wash. And I certainly do everything I can to get out of the car. But nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, when I was a kid, I watched the uh, the cartoon, The Jetson, The City of the Future. I'm fascinated about that, you know. And I think uh, uh, dreams never should become other people's nightmare. And of course, everything shall be sustainable through uh, sustainable inhumanity, perhaps. Uh I am maybe I'm more traditional and I blur the line between the past and the future. Uh, I, I always reach back to the past, uh, somehow using that uh, as the footprint for the future because I live off from the past, right? I can only create future with my memories. So, so, so to me, uh, I, I, I perhaps look at it a different way. I'm trying to bring hospital into a way that touch people's so more so than uh, something feel as I am unfamiliar with it. In other words, how do I make it familiar to them? And I think car drive through uh, is a very interesting idea. I like it. Uh, I, I like the idea that how uh, uh, Ryan 
basically created something between point A and point B. You know? so, so I think that makes the process actually quite interesting. Of course, that will inspire the car maker, the industry designer to say, now what can I do to elevate the car design, right? So, so I think that is very, very interesting, right? I never really thought about car will be part of my hotel design, but rather I always look at my body will be part of my hotel design, right? Because I live in the pedestrian city, right? So, so we got to somehow look at the value, uh, how we value that value and what that value meant uh, for this city, not just for every city, for that particular city. So in fact, that make that city attractive. You know, I love London because I be able to, I'm able to walk and I find things that I'm not able to see elsewhere, uh, like New York, right? But there are cities like California. You know, you can't go anywhere without a car. And equally, I find it quite fascinating sitting in the car for three and a half hours, go all the way down to Newport. So, 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 so I, I think there's a, there's a different aspect of it. But when it comes to wellness, uh, I, I suppose that we, Marcus, in, in this juncture of life uh, with COVID-19, we'll try to figure it out what matters to us. Uh, is it the past that truly matter or is it the future that matter? And what exactly is the future, right? The thing we are familiar with, for example, Kohler. Kohler Kohler's been making plumbing for over hundreds of years, hundred years, right? So, so, so they, they define a bathtub. If they say tub, and most of the people know what that means, but maybe one day they will give up the word tub and they will recreate the, with a new vocabulary and that may redefine our way of taking bath, right? Maybe the top now becomes a device. Maybe that becomes a car. I can take a bath and go somewhere with it. You know, so all this thing is all very possible. And I, I think that I think one thing Ryan says is actually quite very interesting, which I, I find it absolutely quite, quite, quite possible is how we look at uh, uh, the sustainability. In other words, uh, the the not to build something tangible and turn it into a waste. We all know how often you build something and 10, 15 years later, you have to demolish it, right? And that the world resources become very limited. So having this prefab, having this motherboard, having this thing expand, I, I think it is, I think it's a must, you know? And, and of course, everything else, uh, we can certainly add value to it. So I think there's a pros and cons to both. Great. Um, Loon, let's go to you now and let's hear more about the, the Dimensions of Wellbeing um, project that you've put together this year. Right. I'll share my slides. Let me know if you can see them. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Right. So I was going to... It's a good segue into into um, the information and the and the presentation I'm going to share because I, I think you know it's like Ryan talking about you know things at the infrastructure level you know and and Tony coming in to fill that space you know and then for us it's about the product and and the touch points for the user so I think it's great synergy I see a, plenty of overlaps you know great synergy and I think that's why you know I, we Kohler believes you know how architects interior designers and product designers need to come in and, and, and work together work closely together to deliver the right solution um, so so for for my presentation today I, I really want to talk about health and wellness from the consumer perspective because a lot of times for us I think when we talk about the notion of health and well-being we look at our user as the center um, of everything else, right? So, so insights actually forms or informs us uh, in, in a big way for you know everything that we innovate around. Um, and you know, as, as you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's about gracious living. It's about you know having a delightful everyday experience uh, in the bathroom or the kitchen space. And uh, we do know today, if you want your bathroom to be right, yes, there is, the infrastructure has to be right. Yes, uh, you know, um, um, the interior design has to be done beautifully, you know, but there's elements as well. There's lighting, air, you know, there's temperature, there's the water, there's safety, there's sound, there's privacy. How do we connect all of these little elements to allow for a more gracious experience? I think that's fundamentally what, Kohler looks at, you know, whenever we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, um, how do we, uh, from a product design perspective. 
Um, so today I'm going to actually be kind of touching on some high level examples of, you know, just kind of illustrate what we look at um, um, in terms of delivering health and well-being. Um, one of the perspectives we take is, you know, how do we connect the senses, sight, sound, scent, touch, uh, you know, different elements that we, we look at. Uh, and an example to illustrate that is um, one of our latest um, intelligent toilet called Yumi 2. Um, as Tony was alluding to, you know, can, you know, is there a way that we call tub, not call a tub a tub, you know, and, 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 and look at it as a device or redefine what a tub is. This is actually an attempt from us, you know, to redefine what a toilet is or what a toileting experience is. And how do we kind of, kind of look at a multi-sensorial experience? Um, so, you know, as an intelligent toilet, you know, it does what intelligent toilet does. You know, it, it, it has a bidet feature, it cleanses you. Um, but there is the sight and sound aspect of it you know, because, you know, with technology it enables us, you know, to make our toilets way smarter. So, you know, we have a lighting element where, you know, according, depending on time of the day, uh, the light changes, right? So we, we time it to, to the body, body's circadian rhythm. So in the day when you use it, you know, the light will be brighter, so it rejuvenates you. And then, you know, as sun sets, um, you know, it, it, the, the light dims down. So if you use it in the middle of the night, for example, you know, it's really a very dim light, you know, so, so it doesn't break your circadian rhythm. But there's the sound aspect of it, which I think it's a, a layer over and on top of it, which makes the whole toileting experience um, really, you know, kind of like out of the box, right? It's something that you, you don't experience uh, uh, on a toilet. Um, we do have insights from a sound perspective that um, um, when, when humans hear sounds of nature, um, the heart rate typically slows down, right? It comes down, it's wired in our DNA. Um, so, you know, it's actually, you know, it's it will feel more stressful if you are in an environment that's of complete silence. So if you feel a little, you know, if you hear birds chirping, for example, your heart rate comes down, right? Um, so we do embed in this device, you know, an uh, ambient soundtrack, which is timed to um, sun, sunrise and sunset as, as well. So, you know, in the day, for example, you will hear birds chirping occasionally and at night you hear crickets, right? So, so it's a little bit of the sound of nature just to calm you down, right? To, so you pair that up with lighting, right? So they give you a multi-sensorial experience. Um, and the other aspect about health and well-being is clean and hygiene. I spoke a little bit right in the beginning um, of, of, of um, um, this session. Um, you and anyway, in today's context with the COVID situation, you can't really not talk about health and well-being without talking about clean and hygiene. Because, you know, as as we speak to our customers directly, we do know people are very much more aware and very much more acutely conscious of of this, you know, of being clean. Um, and and you know, Cola has been in the clean and hygiene business for 147 years already today. So you know, it's it's very much deeply ingrained in what we do. Um, but at a high level, you know, when we talk about clean and hygiene, we really think about it in three different ways, right? It's about how do we keep the object clean, right? So today we have sensors embedded in our products, you know, in our toilets, in our faucets, where you don't really have to touch it to use it, right? On one hand, it really drives a better experience, more convenience, you know, it keeps the product clean. Of course, we have coating on our uh, faucets, which is, you know, which makes it harder to, you know, for grease to stay on, you know, anti-finger cream coating, for example, is another technology that we use on our, on our products. Um, but more recently with added voice control, where we think um, it's applicable and it's meaningful to our user to drive a more meaningful experience. So, you know, you can talk, call out to the, to the faucet to dispense water at a particular volume or a particular temperature that you like it to. So you don't have to actually touch the, the product that you are using. 
Um, another example is in the commercial space, right? So we have faucets in the commercial space that, you know, you don't have to touch it. You just walk up to it, put your hand under it, you know, and it does dispenses. So, so we also have faucets that does delivers not just water, but soap as well at the same time. Um, and then apart from keeping the object clean, I'd like to talk a little bit about keeping the users clean. So, so that's very much part of health, right? So hygiene is health. So I think the best example in our product portfolio is our bidets as well as our intelligent toilet, right? So, you know, and this is very much a, a Asian thing, right? So if, if you are able to keep yourself clean, you are healthy, right? So, so you know, we, we've been working diligently on the way uh, we deliver water sprays on our intelligent toilet, right? To make sure that it has the right temperature to make sure that it delivers the best comfort, the right coverage so that it cleans efficiently. So those are, you know, different things that we look at, you know, then it's also, you know, we, we upgraded over the years with, with improve and improve upon our flushing system to make sure that, you know, the, the, the toilet remains clean all the time, right? So, so and then also making sure that it's comfortable to use because you know the seat is warmed up before you come in you know and things like that so you know um so all in all delivering a healthier you um and then you can't really and then apart from the object as well as the user we are also looking at the environment um, where we, you know, in, in China, for example, we've launched um, already our second and third generation of our bathroom heaters and bathroom fans. So, so we are, we do know, you know, when, you know, apart from objects and apart from you, you know, you, you do want your environment to be clean. So we have products, you know, where, you know, it, it ventilates the air, but as it ventilates, um, you know, it, it, it takes out bacteria, it filters out your air. Uh, and then there's uh, antimicrobial features in there to take out bacteria, right? So it makes sure that it keeps your air clean. Also, um, with technology, with internet of things, you know, you could connect a bathroom fan to the intelligent toilet, for example. So, you know, once you're done using the toilet, you stand up, the toilet flushes and the bathroom heater or the bathroom hand kicks in to ventilate the air so that the next person that comes into the room will feel that the room is clean. Right. So it's about this connecting of, of and, and harmonizing of uh, um, devices so that it provides the best experience for you. And finally, I, I just want to leave the presentation with, with the message that, you know, we've been in this health and well-being, clean and hygiene business for 147 years, but it's a, you know, it's a work, it's a continuous work in progress for us, right? We're still learning, looking at new opportunities um, um, and trying out technology solutions, right? working with our partners to deliver the best gracious experience for our user. And that's fundamentally what we do. Thank you very much, Loon. Thank you. So how much do you think that the, the changes of behavior that the pandemic has imposed on us how much of that will be permanent do you think and how much will will bathrooms and bathroom products be permanently changed by what's happened in the last few months you talk about touchless um devices for example which have been around for a long time but do you think that that's going to become normal now um i think in big part yes right i, I you know as, as i as mentioned before i think the covid had, um situation what we have gone through in the past year um, has only accelerated many trends. Um, you know, I've, I've been through, you know, I was in Asia when the SARS pandemic was around, right? And, you know, it was, it was not as severe as COVID, uh, but, you know, many countries went through a good three to six months of that. You know, there was a debate. I remember having a debate back then where, you know, we were saying, will user go back to... Um, to life as normal, right? In many aspects, yes, but in many aspects, no, right? So, you know, there is parts of it which, which remains the same, which is why I, I, my, you know, my, my hypothesis is, which is why, you know, in Asia, you know, Asian countries deal with the, the, the COVID situation a lot better because people are more used to wearing masks, for example, right? So I, I think 
that kind of kind of, kind of sets the foundation for it. So, you know, in 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 the in design space, for example, you know, we hear for for example now in the kitchen space where 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 you go for you come back home with groceries, for example, you want to wipe that down, right? And people have been talking about could we have a toilet next to the, the, the main door, for example, a sink next to the main door so I can clean it? Could I have kitchen next to the main door so I can go to the kitchen and wipe things down? Um, I think some of those habits might not go away. Um, it, and it depends on individual, of course, right? But, you know, some individuals will pick that habit up and will probably not go away for a long time, right? So those are some of the potential considerations that we will have to look at down the road. And you mentioned how uh, the Asian countries have been, some of them have been better prepared for COVID because of mask wearing habits. Are our cultures around the world all adopting new bathroom and kitchen trends and technologies at the same rate or are there different div diversions going on? I mean, Ryan, for example, was talking about drive-in hospitals. You can imagine that working in in Wisconsin, but maybe not so much in London and Paris and definitely not Hong Kong because there simply isn't the space for it. Uh, my, my question is, are we seeing uh, cultures diversifying now in terms of their attitudes to hygiene or is, every, is the whole world converging on a, a single solution? Oh, I don't think there will be a single solution. I think, uh, you know, it, it's going to be different. Um, you know, we, we, you know, there's cultural difference for one, you know, look at how Japan, for example, the Japanese bathroom is very different from the American bathroom, right? The, the wet, wet space and the, and the dry zone is, is separate, right? And, and the way they use the bathroom is different. Um, um, you know, um, there are cultures who, who take showers in the morning and there are, there are cultures who take showers at night, right? So just that alone fundamentally shapes differences, you know, uh, um, um, in, in the product and the solutions that we deliver. Um, also, there's climate difference, um, geographical difference, you know, the tropics versus, you know, the northern, the southern hemisphere where it's colder, you have four seasons. So, so those fundamental differences, those can't be the same. So, you know, and in India, in Southeast Asia, Singapore, where I came from, for example, you know, um, bathrooms are a lot more damp, you know, which is why, you know, keeping it dry, it's, it's critical. You know, a bathroom ventilator, for example, uh, you know, to help keep bathroom dry is way more critical in, in um, humid countries as opposed to you know, where I am right now, for example. Right? So, I, I, you know, for, so, so there are those fundamentals that, that will not change, right? The geographical difference, the cultural difference will not change in a short time. Though. So, so, you know, I, I don't think there will be a single, singular solution at the end of the day. Uh, it's been a Marcus, really fascinating may I chime Sorry. In? Oh, yeah, yeah, go Sorry. ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, just a chiming. I, I thought I thought Lum said something quite interesting about uh, cultural difference and, and about Asian living versus global living. I think with this post pandemic, you're going to see a little bit of a merging, defining what and how, what matters to you, either it's in New York, Paris, or London, and how do you uh, make the uh, modification of it. For example, in Asia, nobody wears their shoes at home. So all the shoes park outside. So you walk around in your house uh, with a slipper, right? Now, whereas in New York, where I live, you know, all my friends come to my house with their shoes on, right? So, so, so I think this is something somehow during this pandemic, we all got very sensitive about. So I think the what and how is certainly will become an issue with this post pandemic. And in addition to the last is, we all probably will learn the private versus public. I think they will be two separate lives uh, that will define our lives ahead. It's interesting you mentioned that, Tony, because I was going to say we've got some questions from our audience. And the first question is, is exactly about this privacy. How has privacy as a component for well-being become elevated or diminished as a result of, of COVID? And that's from um, Malakare. Um, you've kind of touched on it already, but how are attitudes towards privacy changing do you think well well as, as, a, as a quick question here is a, a private who allows to come to your house that's one right and i mean there's some country people entertain outside there are some country people often entertain, entertain at home i think that probably will require a new calibration to define what is a new platform for privacy 
right? Now, second part of it is a bathroom. You know, as we know, developer build things as small as it gets. But in the future, it likely may be a private bathroom that I have and a public one where my, my guests come will use. So I think that part of it may be an essential, right? Whether you wear shoes at home or not, is a separate issue. And third, just to address the issue on humanity, I mean, the, the, the wetness in the bathroom, you know, the dampness, anywhere it's wet, you have germs. So oftentimes people need to somehow find a solution. I'm certainly looking for a developer to do that, to say we can keep your bathroom a healthy environment, right? In my case, just in my case, I am in Taiwan right now and I am lucky build this little house, uh, not very big, but I did it with a negative pressure. It is actually a room that I control all the air inside. So it's an ICU room, but I'm not even sick. <laughs> And I never figured that out, right? But because I didn't wish to have outside interference and that's called privacy, right? And in other words, you're not willing to negotiate what you settle with. Yeah. Ryan, what's yeah. your take on this privacy, the, the way that people's attitudes to privacy are changing? Well, I, I don't know. I think one of the, the, the topic that we, I mean, one of the privacy things that we talk about internally is, um, from a privacy perspective is, um, you know, uh, allowing outside people into your home virtually via camera, right? And one of the things they talk about is, will people be more comfortable with having more cameras in your house, right? You see that with, you know, some of the Facebook, Google's application of, of their devices, you know, that, that, you know, they bring Alexa into, into your house. And then we, we, we also talk about, you know, how comfortable will people be willing to put a camera in their bathroom space, right? So we don't know what the answer is, you know, but we wonder if, you know, this whole COVID situation with everybody meeting everybody virtually from all around the world, right? And, and getting really comfortable with that, would it accelerate, you know, the trend of, you know, people being more comfortable with cameras around the house? We don't know, you know, but, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely an interesting topic for us to think about. So you haven't got any examples of people video conferencing from the shower or the bath or even the toilet yet? No, no, we haven't. <laughs> but you never know. Brian, Brian, what about you and your experience? How are attitudes changing towards privacy in, in the, the hospital or in the automobile? Or how is that affecting your work? Well, I, I definitely zoom out and think of society and, and a lot of people trading privacy for convenience. We just think about the, our online habits and, and a sensibility around, well, an online retailer might be knowing, learning a lot about me as I do this, but the convenience benefit outweighs the cost of me sacrificing some privacy. So I definitely see that. In a healthcare environment, it's been really interesting because those patient rooms that we were showing have a lot of transparency between the caregivers in the corridor and the patients and families in the room. And you can modulate that transparency with a curtain. And so we look at those rooms now that they're built and we see how many of the families are closing that curtain in order to increase the privacy or opening the curtain in order to increase the connectivity. And the vast majority actually pull the curtain open. They would rather have that connection to the caregivers or even see when their physician is walking by and, and jump out into the hall to ask them a question so that's an interesting trade-off, and they're much more interested in the connectivity, and privacy is then sacrificed. But we definitely want to be able to modulate it. And a family that doesn't have that sensibility and does want more privacy, we want to give them the ability with that curtain or a snap glass or other kinds of technologies to dial that privacy up so that it's not a um, one-size-fits-all solution. Brilliant. Well, we've run out of time, everyone. It's been a really fascinating conversation. We've, um, we've, we've been talking for over an hour and it's been really wonderful to speak to you all. Thanks so much, Tony, Ryan and Loon for your time. And thanks very much to Cola for putting this talk together.